Okay, so, so welcome everyone to, to yet another edition of the Algebraic Combinatoric Online Workshop. Um, so we have two more talks, exciting talks lined up today. Um, each talk is 35 minutes long, and then there's a break of 10 minutes for questions and, and potentially stretching your limbs. Um, do note that we have coffee time at the very end. So if you, if you have time, stick around. Um, the talk is being recorded and the video will be posted on YouTube later and the speaker's slide should be available online and you should find the link in the chat. Okay, so, so without further ado, um, it's my pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, John Sharishian, and he's gonna tell us about which Schubert varieties are Hessenberg varieties. Over to you, John. Thank you very much for the introduction. Let me thank all the organizers. It's a privilege uh, to speak here. Uh, I would love to be in Stockholm, which is one of my favorite places, but we do the best we can. Uh, so I'd like to tell you about some joint work with my uh, colleagues, Laura Escobar and Martha Precup, uh, who are not responsible for any of the mistakes I'll make. So here's my plan for the talk. Uh, my goal is to uh, communicate to as many people as possible rather than communicate efficiently to experts. Uh, that, that will uh, control the way I'm uh, describing things. Uh, so I want to very quickly remind you about the type A flag variety. We're going to talk in type A almost always. The Schubert varieties therein. So I assume this is well known to many people. Uh, next, I will introduce and discuss Hessenberg varieties, which also live inside the flag variety. And I'll give the first definition that, that was given by the Marian Shaman. Uh, we'll see that very few Schubert varieties are Hessenberg varieties with this definition. However, there's a more general definition of Hessenberg varieties that was given by Goreski, Kotwitz, and McPherson. With this definition, we'll see that every Schubert variety is a Hessenberg variety. Uh, then we can ask some sort of finer questions and I'll just set up some terminology and address this question once more. So we wanna uh, get some relation between two kinds of varieties that live inside a flag variety. Okay, so uh, we fix some N and we fix GLN or SLN and I'll just go back and forth uh, so that my statements are correct regardless of technical uh, minor issues, right? So it's GL or SL depending what we need. Uh, inside there is the group of upper triangular matrices. And the flag variety, one way of understanding the flag variety is to think of SLN is a, is a uh, closed subset in some Euclidean space, and there's a quotient space, the space of cosets. This turns out to be a projective variety. It can be cut from some projective space by homogeneous equations. So that's the flag variety in one instance. Uh, in another instance, well, a flag is a chain of vector spaces, a chain of subspaces, the i subspace having dimension i in complex n space. Uh, our group G acts transitively on flags. That's a basic fact from linear algebra. And our subgroup B is the stabilizer of a flag in which the i space is spanned by the first i standard basis vectors. And so by the orbit stabilizer theorem, these cosets are in bijection with the set of flags. So we can again think of the flag variety as the set of all flags with a certain topology on it. So that's the flag variety. That's a quick review and the kind of notation we're going to use. Um, this slide, well, let me skip the first two points. Since we're in type A, the key point is a fact from linear algebra, which is that every non-singular matrix can be written uniquely as the product of an upper triangular matrix, a permutation matrix, that's what this W dot stands for, and another upper triangular matrix. This is the Bruja decomposition into BB double coset. So this is a disjoint union. Right, and this disjoint union descends down to the flag variety. Right, so we're going to look at cosets represented by elements of a particular double coset. That looks like this I have a permutation matrix. I look at all the cosets represented by this permutation matrix times an upper triangular matrix. That's a Schubert cell. Uh, because of the Bruat decomposition we had above this flag variety is the disjoint union of these Schubert cells. And one way to think about this is these Schubert cells are the B orbits on flags. 
right? And so therefore any B invariant subvariety of the flag variety is a union of some of these Schubert cells. This turns out to be a very, very nice decomposition because each of these cells is in fact a cell. It looks like an affine space, the dimension of the affine space being the length of the associated permutation, the number of adjacent transpositions I need to multiply to get that permutation. Okay, so now what's a Schubert variety? It's just the closure of a Schubert cell in the flag variety, and this turns out to be completely combinatorial to understand these closures. The closure of this Schubert cell associated with the permutation W is a union of Schubert cells, and which Schubert cells live in that union are those corresponding to permutations that live below W in the Bruja order. Okay, and so Schubert varieties then are irreducible B invariant subvarieties of the flag variety, and let me remind you What's this Bruja order that tells us the closure relations? Well, I'm going to remind you by example. So this permutation 3124 lives below 4312 in the Bruja order for three equivalent reasons. The one is that I can get from here to here by a sequence of just exchanging symbols that are in order so that they become out of order in, in such a way that the number of out of order pairs increases by one at every step. That's this. The next is I can write the larger permutation as a product of adjacent transpositions using as few transpositions as possible. So for example, this tells us that the cell associated to this guy here, CW, has the complex dimension five. And now I look and I see a product for this guy inside here. In fact, I see two of them, but all I need is one of them. And the last one, although we won't see it in the talk, but the one that's most useful for us when we're trying to prove things is the tableau criteria. And I learned this from the book of Anders Bjerner and Francesco Brenti. What you do is I take this permutation, I take its first element, I take its first two symbols, I write them in ascending order, the first three symbols in ascending order and so on, I do the same. And what I observe is that this, uh, tableau here dominates this one entry by entry. The, the entry here is always at least as large as the corresponding entry here. So that's the Bruja order. So this tells us that combinatorics enables us to understand the flag variety and certain sub-varieties inside of it very well. Okay, so I, I hope that that's enough to keep everybody going. And now let me tell you about Hessenberg varieties, which are likely to be much less familiar. So a Hessenberg variety will be determined by a Hessenberg vector and a matrix. So let's start with the Hessenberg vector. So this is just a weakly increasing sequence of integers, n integers, uh, such that the ith integers at most n and at least i. Now, in fact, this is the original definition from Damari and Shaman. We want to eventually relax this condition and just assume that these are not all these hi's. Again, they still weakly increase but just that they're non-negative and at most n. And the purpose of a Hessenberg vector is to define a, a vector subspace of the space of all n by n matrices. And rather than staring at all that noise, let me just show you an example on the next page. So what we have here is the Hessenberg vector 2, 3, 4, 4. And what this 2 tells us, so the subspace of the space of matrices is going to be a subspace where certain entries are free, those are the asterisks, and the rest of them are constrained to be zero. And the way we see which are free is just by looking at these numbers. I, the first two entries of the first column are free because the first entry is a two. The first three entries of the second column are free, and so on and so on. The rest of the entries are constrained to be zero. So what you can visualize is cutting out a, per, a Young diagram in French style from the lower left corner of an n by n matrix. If we insist on this condition that hi be at least i, this uh, thing that's cut out lives inside the staircase, right? But it could be arbitrary, okay? So we're cutting out, so, so that's a Hessenberg space. And now what's a Hessenberg variety? So we fix a Hessenberg space or a Hessenberg vector and any matrix we want, n by n, 
And now we're going to take certain flags. And right now we're going to use the COSET model. Which flags G, B do I consider? Those for which G conjugates our given matrix S into this Hessenberg space. And uh, this comes from numerical linear algebra. This uh, particular chosen Hessenberg space, matrices that look like this are in Hessenberg form. And it turns out that uh, certain algorithms run very well if you put matrices in Hessenberg form rather than, say, upper triangular form. Right? But we, we'll put them in arbitrary form. We don't always use a, use a vector like that. Uh, this is well defined because when a matrix lives in a Hessenberg space and I conjugate it by an element of B, it remains in the same Hessenberg space. So this is a well-defined subvariety. This is a projective subvariety of uh, the flag variety. Uh, we can also describe these Hessenberg spaces using flags, and this has a very simple uh, description. So I would like to know again which flags are in my Hessenberg variety. So I start with an arbitrary flag. I have these numbers H1 uh, through Hn, and what I insist is when I apply my chosen matrix S to the ith space, I end up in the hi space. So again, you might see why we would like to insist that hi is at least i. If S is non-singular, which generically it is, and uh, I apply S to vi, the dimension's not going to change. So if hi is less than i, this is going to be empty. But S might be a very low rank matrix, in which case this will make sense or be non-empty even when HI is less than I. So these are Hessenberg varieties. And in fact, as I said, they were originally defined by Damari and Shaman. The idea there was uh, the topology of the Hessenberg variety would tell you something about the complexity of algorithms to put the matrix S into Hessenberg form. Well, let's look at some example, and then I'll describe some properties. So I want to look at a small but non-trivial example. So I'll take H to be the vector 2, 3, 3. And we'll, we'll use the, the flag model, not the coset model. So the first condition says that when I apply S to V1, it has to be contained in V2. The second condition says SV2 has to be contained in V3, but V3 is the whole space. So the second condition is vacuous as is the third condition. So here there's only one condition. I wanna look at all flags like this in C3, such that when I apply my chosen matrix S to the first space in the flag, it's contained in the second. So we can analyze this in a very, very direct fashion. This is a particular example. What we'll do is for each flag, just say what's the first space? What's the one dimensional space in the flag? Then we get a map to P2. Well, if this guy here, the, the first space, is not S invariant, then the second space is completely determined because V1 is contained in V2, SV1 is contained in V2, and V1 and SV1 are different, and that gives V2 no choice to be V1 plus SV1. So most of the fibers of this map are just one point. So this variety looks a lot like P2. If I happen to choose an eigenspace, so one dimensional invariant space for V1, then V2 can be anything because this condition now is vacuous again. And with a little work, let's say that S has K distinct eigenspaces, finitely many or one dimensional, then we can obtain this Hessenberg variety by blowing up K points in P2. Of course, this analysis breaks down once things get complicated, but I just wanted to show some examples. So Hessenberg varieties actually are, in certain instances are familiar. So let me start with something trivial. If S is the zero matrix, then conjugating does nothing, and I'm definitely in my Hessenberg space, so I get the whole flag variety. Similarly, if I choose H to be N, 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 then no matter how I conjugate S, right, my Hessenberg space is, this, is the whole matrix space, and so nothing is going on. So the entire flag variety is realizable. That's boring. More interesting is if S is nilpotent and HI equals I, then we get a Springer fiber. This is used by Springer to construct the irreducible representations of the bio group. Right? So, so these are already something that's been seen before. 
Uh, again, if S is nilpotent, and now HI is I plus one until I get to the end here, uh, then this is a Peterson variety. This was used by uh, Kostin and then Reach to study quantum cohomology of flag varieties. So again, a, a familiar and interesting object. Um, if S is generic, by which I mean diagonalizable with indistinct eigenvalues, and again, HI is I plus one, then this is a very familiar toric variety. This, this was proved by Damari, Parchesi, and Shaman. Uh, you take uh, the fan determined by the braid arrangement. This gives you a toric variety, or if you prefer, you take the, the dual permutahedron, right? And you get a toric variety, and it, it, it was shown, right, by Damari, Parchesi, and Shaman that in but fact, Tom, this is a Hesseberg variety. We have a question. Go ahead. Did you, do you want to state it yourself? Can you read it for me, please? Should I read it for you? Thank you. So is that, uh, so do, do you should have the chat yourself, right? You wrote it. Hello. Okay, I can say it if you want. Yeah. Uh, on the second line, mm -hmm. the, the Springer fiber, mm -hmm. in that case, is it a nilpotent Hessenberg? Yes. Yes. Springer fibers are nilpotent Hessenberg varieties. Right? Where, where I, I mean, basically, if this is 1 through n, what I'm asking is that when I apply my matrix S, which is nilpotent, to the i vector space, it stays inside. So in other words, I'm looking at the S invariant flags, essentially, and that's the Springer fiber. Is that okay? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, shall I go on? Go ahead. Okay. So again, these uh, familiar varieties are Hessenberg varieties, so maybe it's worth studying the general case. And in fact, the study of general case shows lots of interesting things. So these are nice varieties in the sense that they mid-affine pavings. I mean, what Martha shows in more in various Lee types is that under reasonable circumstances, if you intersect these varieties with the Bruja, with the uh, Schubert cells, you again get cells. And this so-called affine paving, that means these are nice. Uh, in general, these are not smooth. When the matrix S is generic, they are, but for arbitrary S, yes, they aren't. However, they often have palindromic Poincaré polynomials anyhow. Um, there are beautiful formulas for uh, combinatorial formulas for the betting numbers of various Hessenberg varieties. This is found in these papers, the original papers of Damari Shaman, Damari Percesi Shaman, uh, Juliana Tomachko has made very nice results, Martha. So, so there's a close relation between these things and combinatorics. Uh, even in the co study of cohomology rings, you see interesting combinatorics, and I, uh, none of I have no claim that my references are comprehensive. I hope nobody who's watching is uh, being uh, given short shrift. And also uh, relations with hyperplane arrangements. And finally, I don't want to belabor this, but because uh, I've been belaboring it for a decade, uh, in the case when S is generic, there are close relations uh, with chromatic symmetric functions and therefore unicellular LLT polynomials and there's a good deal of recent work on that. Okay. So Hessenberg varieties are interesting and they lead to nice combinatorics. So now we have Schubert varieties in the flag variety and Hessenberg varieties. And um, Martha and I saw Juliana ask the following question, is every Schubert variety a Hessenberg variety? Um, you might find this a sort of left field question, but uh, Juliana has been discovering and proving many really interesting things about Hessenberg varieties, and we thought it's worth pursuing. So with the definition I gave you, the answer is a re resounding no. So this is the first result of ours I want to show you, that if the Schubert variety XW is a Hessenberg variety, then W must avoid a certain pattern. Uh, we saw pattern avoidance in, in Anders' talk earlier. And so uh, this tells us, in fact, that very few, with the definition I gave, Schubert varieties or Hessenberg varieties, uh, because of the, the Marcus Tardish theorem, or if you prefer, the, the formerly the Stanley Wilf conjecture, which says that the number of permutations avoiding a given pattern is bounded above by an exponential function of n. 
So we have factorially many permutations, at most exponentially many of which uh, arise, have Schubert varieties arising from Hessenberg varieties. So that's uh, bad news maybe, uh, but in fact, there's more. So there's a much more general definition of a Hessenberg variety. Let me yeah. skip this slide. Uh, yeah. This is a short proof that this particular permutation, 4231, you, you can't realize is a Hessenberg variety. And the general theorem has a similar proof, but uh, I yeah. don't have time. Just to a quick question. Sure. Uh, from Sarah. So if you go back uh, one slide again. Yes. So is this a characterization? Is it even only if? No. Uh, no, there are uh, 19 permutations in S4 which do come from Hessenberg varieties, three that don't, and two which we're working on and think don't. And uh, the other thing is the other non-smooth guy is not, it does come, does come from a Hessenberg variety. So it's a little hard to see what the, the patterns mean. This is not, in fact, we don't know that exponentially many do. We know of quadratically many that definitely do and likely there are exponentially many that do but we don't know how to show that yet we're working on that is that okay. okay thanks okay all right let me skip that proof and get right to the more general definition so this was given by Goreski, Kopwitz and McPherson and so you take any representation of SLN right no arbitrary representation uh, it acts on some vector space B, and I look for some B invariant subspace of V and X in V, and now I can define a Hessenberg variety, again, to consist of all the cosets. Now it's much better expressed in terms of cosets. So all the flags or cosets, such that G inverse puts the chosen vector X into the Hessenberg space H. So if you're familiar with the, the terms, the original definition arises when this representation here is the adjoint representation. But if you think about it, there's no reason you have to restrict yourself to the adjoint representation. The key point is this chosen Hessenberg space is B invariant. Then this is well defined, okay? So this is a much broader class and I don't wanna speak for Laura or Martha, my view on this problem is what the Hessenberg varieties look like. That's the real problem. This is a much larger ocean with many more creatures in it than what you get from the original definition where we have lots, lots of nice results. Here, there's very little known about what these look like. So we can think of Juliana's question as an attempt to get some handle on what arbitrary Hessenberg varieties look like. So this is, you know, we, we don't know much about how these look. However, in this case, every Schubert variety is a Hessenberg variety. And again, I see this, this slide is full of noise, but the idea is the following. We're gonna look in the exterior algebra on the natural module. So CN, I have a representation, the usual representation of SLN on CN, and I take all the exterior products except the two one-dimensional ones. Right? And in this exterior product, I actually choose a B invariant vector. Well, a B invariant one dimensional subspace. I do this in each exterior product. And here, uh, I don't wanna jump into the weeds. The idea is uh, the, the representation and the vector I'm gonna choose don't depend on the permutation. What depends on the permutation is the Hessenberg space. Okay, and those of you who are familiar with weights and representations and so on can probably decode this. So there's a smart way to choose a Hessenberg space for each permutation. I'm not gonna vary the representation nor the chosen vector. And what I'm gonna do is put all these representations together. So this is almost all of the entire exterior algebra on the natural representation. I choose a particular element of this direct sum and a particular direct sum of well-chosen subspaces. And this gives me, in fact, the Schubert variety associated with W. Again, W, I only see over here. The representation and the chosen vector don't change. Okay, so this says in the broad definition, everything every Schubert variety is a Hessenberg variety, so maybe that doesn't tell me too much about what Hessenberg varieties look like. Let me see how I'm doing here. I think I can finish. 
Um, so let's ask a more refined question. This representation here is manifestly reducible. So we might ask, uh, no, sorry. Before I get to that, let me tell you a little bit about the proof. Sorry about that. Uh, again, if you're familiar with the theory of weights, this can be expressed uh, more efficiently, but what I want to do is, is describe it in terms that are understandable. So uh, we start with partitions uh, of, uh, with the most n minus one parts. These parameterize our irreducible representations. Um, we append zeros until they're n parts, and now we think of these as vectors in Rn on which Sn acts. And it's a result of Theodore that uh, you can find the Bruja order by looking at differences of uh, these vectors obtained by permuting the entries of partitions. Right? Now, you can make a setup uh, for arbitrary Lie type, we could define the Hessenberg varieties in arbitrary Lie type. Uh, it turns out that this theorem of Deodar only holds in type A, and this is why we have very little to say in other Lie types right now. Okay, let me go on. The, the representation we use is manifestly reducible, so we could ask what happens if we have an irreducible representation? And the answer is we don't know yet, but we know some things. The trick is these, these Schubert varieties are B invariant, uh, manifestly. These Hessenberg varieties typically aren't. So you're kind of looking for a needle in a haystack unless you take X to be a common eigenvector for B. Then the Hessenberg variety is going to be B invariant. That's not hard to see. Right? So we want to ask what happens if we take X to be an eigenvector for B. Now it turns out that in the irreducible representations, which are parameterized by these partitions, there's a unique eigenspace for B, always. So we take some generator, and now there's a natural choice. Like I said, given W, as in the case where we had a positive result, there's a natural choice uh, for the Hessenberg space, and we make that, and we'll call this a highest weight Hessenberg variety, it depends on W, and we'd like to know if this is the W Schubert variety, and we have some results. Uh, it allows us to construct exponentially many Schubert varieties that are Hessenberg varieties. So if W is a Coxeter element in some standard parabolic subgroup, uh, then you can find some irreducible representation which realizes XW. Uh, there's a Fibonacci number, so exponentially many such W. Um, if I take a, a partition that kind of dominates a geometric series, then there's an explicit pattern avoidance criterion uh, for the Schubert variety being a Hessenberg variety. So I think this is pretty interesting. This is an if and only if pattern avoidance criterion. Um, I don't know where the patterns come from. However, not every Schubert variety is the highest weight Hessenberg variety. You can't do this with this partition. Uh, there's a shorter partition. Laura told me that 134562 also does not come from a Hessenberg variety. So uh, we're in the process of uh, understanding criteria for when Schubert varieties are highest weight Hessenberg varieties. That's ongoing. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for your attention. And again, thanks very much to the organizers. Thank you, John, for the excellent talk. Folks, everybody, please take a moment to, to show your appreciation either by clapping or using the reaction button. Um, and it's over to Peter for the questions. Yes, so, so maybe Zachary Haymaker could uh, pose his question. Yeah, so I was asking earlier in the uh, previous conversation uh, about pattern avoidance with Hessenbergs. You said that if it avoided, I, I believe it was four, two, or if it contained four, one, two, three, maybe, then it wasn't a Hessenberg variety. This was in the original sense, not the, the broader sense. Uh, four, two, three, one. Four, two, three, one. And then you said there were other bad patterns in S4. And I was just wondering if you thought that in general, if you contain a, uh, if pi is not Hessenberg and sigma contains pi, does sigma all 
also have to be not Hessenberg? We're, we're trying to prove that uh, yeah. now. Okay. Great. Uh, we hope this is true. And then, I mean, uh, we might hope that in fact, uh, these, so how to say, for the, for the general, so for the original definition, I think there's some hope there's a, pa a complete pattern avoidance criterion with finitely many patterns. Uh, for these uh, highest weight Hessenberg varieties, we're pretty confident there isn't that the, uh, the sentence you said is true if sigma is bad and pi contains sigma pi is bad, but there are probably infinitely many minimal bad sigma. This is what we think. We have no proofs of anything. Great, thank you. Um, is there any more questions? Are there any more questions? I have my hand up, and maybe there's a, Sam has ah, a hand up too in the participation. Okay, so I'm looking at the chat. Okay, so so maybe Sam Hopkins, Samuel. Hi there, nice to talk. Um, thank you. I was wondering if uh, your perspective here of realizing Schubert varieties as Hessenberg varieties could maybe um, give a new perspective on. Kajdan Lustig polynomials, or um, maybe a, like a, a definition of Kajdan Lustig polynomials for these more general kind of varieties, if you've thought about that at all? Uh, I would say we haven't. Uh, I'm pretty confident that there's close relations between uh, certain Hessenberg varieties and Kajdan Lustig theory, but uh, uh, my ideas are somewhat vague at this point, and I don't, I can't answer your question. And Sarah, you had a question? Yeah, I'm curious, how far can you calculate these things? To your handle on the so, so in fact, for the highest weight Hessenberg varieties, so, so there's an algorithm there's a, a, an algorithm that will produce, uh, under the first definition, uh, lots of Schubert varieties as nilpotent Hessenberg varieties, uh, just by a very straightforward algorithm where the seed is um, a nilpotent matrix, an upper triangular nilpotent matrix, and an anti-chain of uh, roots in the root order. And then, you sort of force a D invariant uh, Hessenberg variety, which might or might not be irreducible. Um, for the uh, the second, for the highest weight Hessenberg varieties, in fact, you can use the uh, essential set uh, of a permutation uh, realized as permutations that are minimal with respect to not being below it in the Bruja order to get linear conditions on the entries of a weight uh, that, um, that will determine whether you, the uh, given highest weight Hessenberg variety is in fact the desired Schubert variety. And so you, you get some cone and this cone is either uh, infinite or empty. And when it's empty, you exactly get a Hessenberg variety that's not a highest weight Schubert variety. So mm -hmm. there we again have an algorithm. I think we're maybe up to S7 or S8 where we can tell which things are, are and are not uh, highest weight Schubert varieties. Uh, we're using Sage, I would guess some special purpose, right? Programming uh, might do better, but I don't know. I'm ignorant of such things. Great. S7 or S8 is kind of nice. I mean, there are these weird examples of like the 3 2, 1 hexagon avoiding permutations. They were mm -hmm. found because we thought we had a conjecture which was going to be 3 2, 1 avoiding and couldn't quite prove it and had to look one higher in S8 to find the bad problem. Oh, okay. So yeah, I, I don't know exactly where we are, but I think for this highest weight, like I said, the, the, the most likely thing is there's not a, a finite set of patterns whose avoidance tells you anything. Uh, th these linear conditions are of the form like xi is greater than, or, or lambda i is greater than the sum of some lambda j's. You have a bunch of these, right? And, and so it, it doesn't mesh so well with pattern avoidance, I think. Mm -hmm. It's not clear to me. Anyway. Looks like it's meshing pretty well to me. We'll have to see. So there's a question from Maria Gillespie. 
Would you state your question? Hi, yeah. Um, Hi. I was just wondering, I, these highest weight Hessenberg varieties, are they somehow like uh, fundamental building blocks to understand other Hessenberg varieties, or are they just like a special natural thing that you would, I mean, obviously uh, they're a natural I, thing you would try would to understand, but I was wondering if they have some... The you know, second, support. that the, the, the idea is that, right, what really, what What's going on with these highest weight things and with Deodar's theorem is we're trying to understand uh, the relation between the Bruja order and the usual order on the weight lattice, right? the usual partial order on the weight lattice. So the Hessenberg space we're picking is basically you have this highest weight, you apply W inverse to the highest weight, and you look at the sum of all the weight spaces that live above that and below, right, and the actual highest weight in the weight order. And the real question is sort of, how well that reflects the Bruja order for a particular permutation. And I so think. that's how, you know, that's what we're doing. And, and so an understanding of these, in, in fact, is not going to lead to an understanding of all of them in any way, right? It's yeah. just some kind of really tailored to this particular question. Cool. Yes. Thanks. I have a question. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, and two questions I have. Uh, one is somewhere in your uh, decomposition, you said there is a smart choice in the decomposition. Uh, and what do you mean by smart choice? One. Number two, uh, you have discussed today uh, which Schubert varieties are Heisenberg varieties. If it's not asking too much in here, uh, what kind of Schubert varieties would be nilpotent Heisenberg varieties? Ah, so so let, let me get at the first que the, the second question first. So we, in fact, uh, under the first definition, which is where we are, if we want to talk about nilpotent Heisenberg varieties, at this point, we don't know any Schubert variety, I think, that is a Hessenberg variety and not a nilpotent. So that, that's a very good question, but we're only messing around in, with for small n. So uh, the, I said at some point when n is four, there are 19 that we know are Hessenberg varieties. Uh, every, the reason we know those 19 are Hessenberg varieties is exactly because this algorithm, which checks nilpotent Hessenberg varieties, spits out these 19. And the other doesn't spit out the two we don't know about. And what we think is, in fact, you can't get them anyhow, even if you take a non nilpotent matrix. So this is a good question, a very good question. And, you know, this, I don't have a guess as to the answers, which is, is every, is every Schubert variety that's a Hessenberg variety actually a nilpotent Hessenberg variety? I don't know the answer to that and would like to know. Uh, your first question, I, if I understood it correctly, I think uh, is sort of, uh, I want to answer it the same way I answered Maria's question, which is that the good choice of Hessenberg space we're making is one which gives us a good chance of getting a particular uh, Schubert variety by using the action of W on the weights. That, that's how, the, the way we're doing this is, Right, we have a, if we have an irreducible representation, there's a highest weight, we apply W inverse to the highest weight, and this weight we get that way tells us which B invariant space to choose. Right? And that's what I meant by good. Thank you. Okay. So Neil has a question. Is this one more question? See Hannah. Do you have a question? Theo. Okay. No, Theo was that was the question. Oh, my apologies. No, no, I, no, I, am, I, I do have a question. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a different <laughs> theory. It's a different person. <laughs> okay. um, uh, great, great talk, John. Uh, thank thank you. you. I, I wanted to ask you about the Poincaré polynomials. Do you have, uh, uh, for the generalized Hessenberg varieties or just for the highest weight ones or for some families of them, do you either have a combinatorial way to produce the Poincaré polynomial or some structural result like Marsas? No, when when they aren't Schubert varieties, we don't know. I, you know I, I I don't think I don't know if Martha or Laura are here. They could holler if they know something I don't. But I don't know. That's fairer to say. Uh, no, right? We we know very little about these general Hessenberg varieties, right? And and uh, there, there are a few conjectures. Uh, there's work on certain classes. Uh, 
by Chung, Billinen, and Shui in representation theory. And they have conjectures on constraints on uh, generators of cohomology. Uh, it's a sort of technical looking conjecture, at least to me. And other than that, I don't know anything right, that, that uh, you know, that constrains the structure of these things. Uh, so it seems to me it's a, it's a large sea of objects. And who knows? Thank you. All right, let's thank Jong again, if there are no further questions. Um, and we'll reconvene in three minutes. Thank you very much for listening.